Well, it seems like it's been a while since I've uh, uh, shared the word, and uh, uh, what is it? Almost two months. But the reason being is that we've had a bit of a had a bit of time off, bit of a break, because we've just we just recently purchased our own home, so we've just kind of been, uh, you know, just uh, you know, feeling our way through the new house and making it a home, basically. So uh, yeah, it's been a, a wonderful experience. It's actually pretty awesome to know that you're in your own place. So um, uh, praise the Lord for that. But let's move on here. See that? Okay. Amen. Well, <clears throat> this morning, I uh, yeah, let's talk about love. And I think uh, I kind of feel that this morning, with everything, with with, with the worship and the uh, and and the uh, and the prayers and uh, and the communion, it's just so appropriate for this morning because uh, you know what we want to um, what I wanted to emphasize this morning is is the preciousness of the love of God. And so, yeah, let's talk about love, you know. <clears throat> love is a many splendid thing, you know. Um, all you need is love. Love makes the world go round. I don't know if you remember that old Burt Bacharach song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing, you know, that the world is short supply of. But... Um, but this morning, I thought it was appropriate to mention a few of these love song titles, the very well-known ones. But first up, I just wanted to read this beautiful piece of romantic poetry uh, to you this morning. So here we go. It says, you are beautiful, my darling. I should look at my wife when I'm saying it. <laughs> you are beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are as white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Your smile is flawless, each tooth matched with its twin. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is inviting. Your cheeks are like the rosy pomegranates behind your veil. Your neck is as beautiful as the Tower of David, jeweled with the shields of a thousand heroes. And this is where it gets a little bit intimate. <clears throat> Your breasts are like two fawns, twin fawns of a gazelle grazing among the lilies before the dawn breezes blow and the night shadows flee. I will hurry to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful my darling, beautiful in every way. Now, if you're astute and you know the Word of God and you know the Bible, then you would know that this passage is from Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. So here, Solomon the king is describing his bride and his desire to be with her. Um, you know, if you were to take this passage literally... If you were to take this passage literally, I wonder what the description of this lover would look like. And well, some cheeky person actually did that. And so this is what they came up with. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty scary, isn't it? It's quite freaky. I'm glad that it is not a literal depiction. It's very symbolic, it's very poetic, and it's a beautiful piece of uh, poetry. You know, the title of my message is actually from the book of Song of Solomons, or Song of Songs. And what I love about the Bible is not only does it consist of a song book of 150 psalms, we also get this Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. And uh, Pastor Jack Hayford, uh, I don't know if you know, but Pastor Jack Hayford wrote that beautiful chorus, Majesty, that we've you know, been singing for many, many, many years, and uh, that song just still has, it's still a beautiful and powerful song. And, uh, well, he wrote in his Bible handbook about the Song of Solomon, he said, he said, the Song of Solomon is interpreted many ways, from an ancient poem celebrating romance to a personal disclosure of Solomon's affection for his wife, uh, to an allegory of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his bride. 
the notions about human sexuality, married love making, and sensual delights. And sensual delights. Um, well, there you go. The Bible has everything, um, including the entire book. Is de- this, this entire book is dedicated to love, the deep intimacy between a man and his wife. It's, um, it's very romantic, and I don't think any other religious writing or holy book would even come close to that. And yes, it is included in the Holy Bible. So the Song of Solomon is an in-your-face, Holy Spirit-inspired declaration of God's delight and a married couple's delight in one another, both in romantic feelings and in their sexual relationship. It is a holy thing. You know, God said at the beginning that when he looked at all of his creation and all that he had made, including Adam and Eve, to whom he commissioned to go and be fruitful and multiply, he declared, it is good. And there's no need to be prudish or moralistic about some, something that God himself created and established in the very beginning. But of course, you know, when we delve a little deeper, you know, we discover there is a, um, there is a spiritual application uh, that the picture of intimacy and unity between Christ and his church, his bride, this love-based covenant established through his self-sacrificial death on the cross. We see his death. <clears throat> we see in his death the love of the king for his bride. Paul said, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And when we look at what Jesus did by dying on the cross, we see love in action. <clears throat> the very nature of love itself is self sacrificial. Um, This is what Paul says in Romans. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I love that. That while we were still sinners, Christ died. Died for us, and that's the amazing love of God. It was demonstrable. You know, when I was a young Christian back in the day, I loved a Christian band called DC Talk. I don't know if anyone's heard of DC Talk. I love DC Talk even to this day. But anyway, they had a song called Love is a Verb. Love spelled L U V. Love is a Verb. And uh, here is, I just wanted to show you a verse from that song. And basically, this song, or the verses were actually rapped. I'm not going to rap it. I'm just going to read it. Michael's uh, happy about that, um, because I can't rap. But here's the verse anyway, and I thought it was quite appropriate for this morning. It says, back in the day, there was a man. Actually, when I start reading it, after a while, I'm kind of, I'm hearing it, and I'm thinking, man, maybe I should just rap it. But it says, back in the day, there was a man who stepped out of heaven, and he walked the land. He delivered to the people an eternal choice with a heart full of love and the truth in his voice. Gave up his life that we may live. How much love could the Son of God give? And this is the line I love. Here is the example that we ought to be matching because love is a word that requires some action. Love is a verb. Love is an action word. Love is not something that is merely sentimental and gooey and based on what you emotionally feel. Though I will say this, that the emotion of love in worship is totally legit, you know, um, in response to God's love toward us in worship. You know, um, you know, when you watch the TV show, The Chosen, and I love watching that, that show, The Chosen, the TV show, and it has Jesus, and when he performs a miracle, and you see it vis- visually, And I can't help but get emotional, Um, you know, when I see those scenes and I just cry, just just thinking about how kind and loving and how merciful, you know, our Lord Jesus is. And that's how my heart responds to his goodness, responds in worship with tears of joy and gratitude. And we even know that the heart of the law of Moses was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's loving God with your entire being 
And that includes our emotions, so it's completely legitimate to be emotional when we worship God. But God's love was demonstrated by the Lord Jesus when he gave up his life, a ransom for many. So in Song of Solomon, this is where the title of my message comes from. He says, He brought me to his banqueting place, and his banner over me is love, waving overhead to protect and comfort me. And what this particular verse is describing when it speaks of his banner over me, it, um, it, it conveys the idea that we are actually secure in his love with complete assurance that, that you are safe in his love. There is absolutely no fear or shame or insecurity in our hearts when we know that we are fully loved by God. The scripture says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We have no fear of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. That's the order of things. We love because he first loved us. So we'll be able to stand with confidence and boldness even on the day of judgment, because even as Christ is perfect in holiness and in righteousness, so are we in this present age, and so will we be on that day. How is it that we can be so bold and confident before God? Because the love of God has been perfected among us as the body of Christ. That is, it has been made complete. It is grounded in the fact that in this world we will be like him, just as Jesus was loved by the Father, so are we loved by God. And that's where our confidence comes from. It comes from our confidence is based and established in the love of God. There is no fear in love. The Apostle John says, the love that gives us confidence banishes fear. Fear in this passage speaks of you know, a slavish, servile fear, a fear that anticipates punishment, a fear that anticipates and expects punishment. Well, there's no room for that kind of fear in love because the two are incompatible. Just as oil and water cannot mix, these two won't mix. You know, we can love God and reverence Him in worship. We can love God and reverence Him simultaneously. But we cannot approach Him in love and hide from Him in fear at the same time. You know, I can understand how tormenting that it can be you know, in the soul of a believer that thinks or feels that he or she is not right with God, becoming so fearful to approach God even when they have already been accepted in Christ. Um, you know, as Christians, we need not fear. Fear not, for I am with you, as the chorus once went. Because we have been forgiven of all of our sins. And I pretty much say this in every message that I share, that the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sins, past, present, and future. So this false, cringing fear is overcome by his love for us. Remember, we don't try to love God so that God responds by loving us back. That sounds like works, religion. We love God because he first loved us. You know, just that one change in perspective um, makes all the difference in the world. <clears throat> Have you, I don't know if you've, I'm, and I'm speaking from a, a guy, a dude's perspective, but, you know, have you ever tried to make someone love you who was clearly not into you? Um, and you kind of delude yourself into thinking that, uh, that I can win this person, you know? And you basically try to love bomb them, you know, with flowers and sappy text messages and gifts. And what ends up happening is the person getting a restraining order on you. I'm not speaking from experience. <laughs> well, maybe partly from experience, but without the restraining order part. Um, but God's banner over us is his love. 
our God waves his flag high above our heads and we can declare with great assurance that I am my beloved's and he is mine. You know, we can love God because he is 100% into us. Therefore, we don't have to try to force God to love us. You know, Pastor Joseph Prince says in his book, The Power of Right Believing, in a chapter that I love, I love the title of his chapter, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Pastor Joseph says, uh, while our love for God can fluctuate, uh, his love for us remains constant. His love for us is based on who he is, not based on what we do. So the love of God is something that cannot be measured. The love of God is something that cannot be fathomed by the human mind. You know, trying to comprehend the greatness of his love is like trying to, is trying to count the stars or grasp the stars or hug the oceans of the world. It's an impossible thing to do. God's love is an everlasting love because he is everlasting. God's love is eternal because he is eternal. God's love is so vast, so wide, so deep that you could never truly grasp it, only receive it. We are only accepted by God. Are we accepted by God? We are loved by God because we are in the beloved. We are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have been accepted in the beloved. Um... You know, God's love is everlasting love because he is everlasting. God's love is so vast, so wide, so deep. Amen. And what did Paul say? He said, For I am fully persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, nothing. And Paul was persuaded and he was totally, 100% convinced that God's love toward us has been forever bound to us because we are forever bound to Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Not even your sin will ever separate you from God's love. You know, Christians may come under self-condemnation and guilt and shame as a result of sin. And don't get me wrong, sin is not good. But for Christians, when we know that we are deeply loved by God, we can walk confidently in who we are in Him without fear or condemnation, even when we do sin. God continues to love us even in our failings. God continues to love us in the midst of our sin and in our mistakes. That's the amazing love of God. That's the amazing grace of God. Amazing grace. God's ongoing, relentless love toward us is his grace in action. His undeserved, unmerited favor, the steadfast love of the Lord, it never ceases. You know, I think of John, who in his gospel, I think four times, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he had this revelation of God's love for himself. Personally, did Jesus love John more than, let's say, Peter or any of the other disciples? I don't think so. But I remember Pastor Joseph Prince saying that what John was doing was practicing the love of Jesus for himself, personally. I mean, have you ever tried to practice, you know, the love of God for you personally? Have you, have you ever said to yourself, I am the disciple whom Jesus loved? I am the disciple whom Jesus loves? I mean, to say it right now, just say it to yourself. I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. Just say it, just say it to yourself. I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's just a powerful truth to confess. And, uh, you know, when I do it, I am the disciple. I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I just feel that, that, that the love of God just begin to embrace me. You know, when we boast of our love for God, you may sense that there is a distance between you and God. And why do I say that? Because maybe it's due to the idea that when we boast of 
our love for God, as Joseph Prince put it, our love can fluctuate and we can feel that when we're doing okay, then we can boast about God's love, but when things aren't going that great, you know, maybe, you know, maybe not. But, um, you know, when we, when we think like that, we kind of think, well, you know, when things aren't going so great, you know, maybe I've come out of God's love, maybe I've come out from under his banner of love, you know, the whole he loves me, he loves me not kind of mentality kind of comes into your mind. Oh, does he love me? I don't know. But the kind of, that, that kind of mentality just goes back to trying to behave in a manner that tries to earn God's love. And we can't earn God's love. It's by grace. But when you begin to boast about how much Jesus loves you, when you begin to boast about how much Jesus loves you, instantly there is a sense of closeness, unity, oneness, intimacy. Like John, who was so aware of Jesus' love for him that he made a point of it in his own gospel. I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, what's interesting is that it was John, alongside his brother James, who when, who, whom Jesus called sons of thunder, right? Because of their fiery personalities, and at one point, as they passed through Samaritan village, they asked Jesus if they could call down fire from heaven to consume the Samaritans. You know, I can just imagine Jesus just shaking his head. He goes, oh, you don't know what spirit you're of, you know. Uh, it's a better way. Uh, this same John became the apostle of love. That's what I find hilarious. Here you've got this guy so fiery in his personality, wanting to just consume people, you know, with fire from heaven, just call fire down from heaven, and he becomes this apostle of love. And here's just a, here's a, I think it's kind of a cute little story about John the Apostle. It says that the blessed John the Evangelist lived in Ephesus until extreme old age. His disciples could barely carry him to church uh, and he could, and he could um, not muster the voice to speak many words. So he's very old, obviously. You know, during individual gatherings, he usually said nothing but little children love one another. Little children love one another. The disciples and the brothers in attendance, annoyed because they always heard the same words, finally said, teacher, why do you always say this? Why do you always say this? And he replied with a line worthy of John, because it is the Lord's commandment, and if it alone is kept, it is sufficient. I think that was a, that's a beautiful account of John's life. You know, and we know that it was John who, as a young man, perhaps a teen at the time, uh, during the Last Supper, rested on Jesus' breast, you know? And how is that for intimacy? You know, you could only feel that confident if you knew, and you could only know that Jesus loves you to be able to approach Jesus and just rest on his chest. It's a very intimate thing. And this is the same John who wrote, God is love. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And as believers, we have known and believed the love of God that he has for us. And we know that the love of God um, for us is not just merely some sort of you know, philosophical, theological idea, but the love that God has for us, we've experienced it firsthand. This knowledge of God's love is experiential knowledge. It's not just a bunch of, you know, not just a bunch of just knowledge that we have in our head. It's experiential knowledge. So, we are recipients of his love in Christ Jesus. When we believed on him for salvation, and we have experienced being taken out of the kingdom of darkness, and we've experienced a new kingdom We've been translated into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And that's where we abide, and that's where we dwell in His love. So what is meant by God is love? Well, let's first go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, obviously this is a chapter that we all know. It's, it's, it's the love chapter. Um, so we get a description of love here. And because God is love... Uh, this will give us some insight into what he's like. So we read, Love suffers long and is kind. 
Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. You know, um, you know when Mike and Wendy got married, uh, they set up a big sign in the park, the big word it spelled love. Looks like, looks like that. <laughs> well, Mike told me that, um, you know, when they put the word love up, he, he wanted to make sure that, that people knew what kind of love they were trying to convey, you know, at their wedding. Um, and I'm pretty sure that they weren't just talking about some airy fairy, candy floss type of love that the world offers and just kind of like gives you a sweet taste in your mouth and then it just fizzes and then it's gone. Or you get sick from eating too much of a type of love. It wasn't that kind of love that they were talking about. Not that temporal love. But we're talking about the love of God that is eternal and it endures forever. You know, and if you were to replace the word for love for God in the, those verses, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you will get an inkling of what God is like in his being and in his character. So, uh, oh, okay. Yes, that's perfect. So what does it mean that God is love? Love is an attribute of God. Love is a core aspect of God's character, his person. God's love is in no sense in conflict with his holiness his righteousness, his justice, or even his wrath. All of God's attributes are uh, in perfect harmony. Everything God does is loving, just as everything he does is just and right. God is a perfect example of true love. And this last sentence I love, it says, Amazingly, God has given those who receive his son Jesus as their personal savior the ability to love as he does through the power of of the Holy Spirit. I'll read that last sentence again. Amazingly, God has given those who receive His Son Jesus as their personal Savior the ability to love um, as He does through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, so God has um, God has what is called non-communicable attributes and communicable attributes. So what's that all about? Basically, the non-communicable attributes of God are attributes that only He can exercise. Uh, for example, His omnipresence, His omniscience, His... Um, what's the other one? Omnipotence? So, yes. So om omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience. And so we know what those are. He's everywhere present. He's all-knowing and He's all-powerful. Um, these are non-communicable attributes of God. I know some of us would love to be able to, you know, to exercise some of, those, some of those attributes, but if you've seen uh, Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey, it doesn't end well. So, but the communicable attributes of God are those attributes that he shares with us, such as you know, wisdom, truth, faithfulness, and of course his love. And he gives us the ability to love as he does. And Paul the Apostle says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given. So we are able to function in his love towards one another also by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know, I love what John Stott says in his commentary on uh, 1 John chapter, one, uh, chapter 4, verse 16. He says, the love that is eternally in God and was historically manifested in Christ has come to fruition in us. The love that is eternally in God and was historically manifested in Christ, you know, on the cross, has come to fruition in us. So as I finish, um, let's just go to Galatians 5. So what does it look like, this love that is to come, that, is, that has come to fruition in us. What does this love look like? 
In Galatians, Paul says, this is what it looks like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And so you will notice that it is, um, it is the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular. So the fruit you will notice is singular, the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. And you will also notice it is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not our fruit. These aren't virtues that we can just conjure up and make happen on our own strength. But man, we try, don't we? You know, today we'll work on patience. Today we'll work on love. Today we'll work on joy. But what usually happens when we try to work things out in the flesh, we fall flat on our faces, and that's why they're called works of the flesh, not fruit of the flesh. Now, I've I've heard people talk about the works of the flesh as fruit of the flesh. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not the fruit of the flesh. It's the works of the flesh. Because works are performed. They're things that we do. Fruit, on the other hand, grows naturally. It develops into maturity as they remain connected to the vine, their life source. So each virtue demonstrates the various aspects of his love and naturally manifests in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's organic, and we can rest and not strive to produce fruit because he produces the fruit. We get to bear the fruit as we abide in his love. And I think that it's so cool that we can partake in expressing and sharing the love of God with one another and to a lost world as well. You know, the world obviously desperately needs the love of God. And what a joy and what a privilege to not only be objects of his love, but be a pipeline or conduits through which the love and the mercy and the grace of God can flow through. And uh, I'll, I'll finish with this passage. Amen, I love this. Paul the Apostle said, and, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand. It's too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you so much for the preciousness of the love of God, Lord. That, Lord God, we love because you first loved us. And, Lord, we thank you that you have chosen us, Lord God, to be uh, conduits of your love as well. And even at, um, you know, even thinking about uh, Dave's communion, where it says that they will know that you're my disciples because of the love that we have for one another. And Lord God, I pray that the love of God will continue to be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Lord God, that you would enliven us, Lord God, with your life and with your love and with your grace. Lord God, that we would be gracious people, that we would be a gracious people, um, freely demonstrating and, and displaying the wonderful love of God that you have showed towards us, Lord. God, I just pray for everyone here, Lord God, that as they go home, they would meditate on the fact that they are disciples whom Jesus loves personally, with a personal love. He loves you individually, personally. And when we come together and celebrate communion, we can celebrate communion knowing that we are deeply, deeply loved by the Father. And our response to him is worship. So we thank you, Father, for your presence. We thank you for your love. May you continue to bless us this week. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you.